Okay, so we're, we're going to talk about um, praxis, and there are two pathways that we're going to talk about, the lateral corticospinal tract and the corticobulbar tract. Um, the, the, here, here's a picture of the, the lateral surface of the brain. Here's the front. Here's the back. Here's the temporal lobe. Here's the sylvian fissure. And I'm going to guess that this sulcus right here is the central sulcus, which makes this the somatosensory strip and this the motor strip. And remember that the motor strip has a topography so that the head, uh, the, the facial muscles um, are represented here, whereas the um, hands and, and arms and then legs and then uh, uh, like the the glutes are represented over on the on the other uh, on the medial surface of the hemisphere. So there's a topography, and the amount of space given to various parts of the um, of the control of the body is proportional to how finely you can control that. So. There's way more space given to the control of your thumb than to your entire trunk. There's way more space given to the control of lips than to all of the legs. So uh, what you can control, the, the, the degree to which you can control it finally, the degree to which it is a distal muscle um, is going to dictate how much neural territory it can command. The big areas are going to be lips in, in the motor strip are going to be lips uh, and, and, and hands. And what is, what is coded for in the motor cortex? Well, it's not the situation where you're going to lose one muscle so, or that one muscle is coded by, by um, neurons in one place. What tends to be coded for are, are primitive the primitive building blocks of common actions, such as what, what's a really common one? Bringing food to the mouth, bringing food to the mouth. So that's what appears to be mapped along here are these very uh, important fundamental movement uh, primitives. And so bring food to the mouth, pushing something away, uh, reaching and grasping, these are the kinds of things that you can get out of motor cortex. When you step back over into premotor cortex and supplementary motor area, you'll find, what you'll find is, is that they come together in, in larger uh, uh, coordinated um, actions. So the 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 first thing to understand is, is the topography of this, not just what's there, but how much space it takes. And, and then also to remember where the blood vessels, uh, what blood vessels are involved. So the blood vessel that is, is supplying the convexity all the way back to about here, somewhere in the parietal lobe, uh, this is all middle cerebral artery. So middle cerebral artery, if, if, there's, a, uh, is the, if there's a blockage, either in the superior division or in the whole root of the whole middle cerebral artery, um, there will be a loss of everything pretty much from the trunk up. Um, now, there's another piece here, which is the watershed zone. Remember that this is a place where the anterior cerebral artery and the middle cerebral artery both uh, supply blood. There's anastomoses. And so there's a double supply. But in times of hypotension, blood will not reach these endpoints in either distribution, in either the anterior or the middle cerebral artery distribution. And this little bit will be out of blood. And that gives you the so-called man in a barrel syndrome, where the, the hands are good, um, the, the feet are good, the backside's good, but the trunk, the trunk, which is served in this uh, watershed zone, is, is out of commission. Okay. So we've been through, we've, we've looked at the pathway for the 
corticospinal tract um, and to a certain extent for the corticobulbar tract a little bit before. We're going to go over it one more time. And the point of going over it one more time is to show you the topography within the corticospinal and corticobulbar tracts as at each level. So we've just seen the topography in motor cortex, and now we're going to step back. All this information is going to go through the corona radiata and then collect in the internal capsule in a very specific place. So this is a horizontal, an axial cut through the brain. Here's the front. Here's the back. This is the lateral ventricle with the caudate. Here's the putamen. Um, and you see the thalamus right here. And you see that the internal capsule has this uh, butterfly shape. It's, it's, a, it's as though it's a separated X. It's half of an X. Here's one internal capsule. Here's the other. This is the anterior limb. This is the knee or genu. G-E-N-U, genu, and this is the posterior limb. Well, it turns out that the corticobulbar tract travels in the genu, and the corticospinal tract travels in the posterior limb. Here is the anterior limb, here's the genu, here's the posterior limb. Anterior limb, genu, posterior limb. And this is where the corticobulbar tract uh, travels, so next one, Behind it, what do you think? Arms or legs? Well, it's going to be arms. So head, uh, uh, cortical bulbar, arms, trunk, legs. All right? So now, as long as we follow where the cortical bulbar is, everything else follows from that. Um, as you come down in the... Uh, uh, so remember that the uh, cerebral peduncles at the base of the midbrain, here's the midbrain, the, here's the thalamus, the cerebrum has been taken off, so has the cerebellum been taken off. This is the third cranial nerve, these are the mammillary bodies, here's the optic chiasm, the infundibular stalk going to the pituitary. These are the cerebral peduncles. This middle third is where the corticospinal and corticobulbar tract travels. The corticobulbar tract travels on the medial and then it's so it's it's corticobulbar arms trunk leg. So head, arms, trunk, leg. You might wonder what is the trunk piece of this? There's no lateral corticospinal tract to the trunk. It only goes to the hands and the and, and the and the feet or the arms and the legs. Um, and the trunk piece of it is the ventral corticospinal tract. So there's plenty of ventral corticospinal tract innervation of, of trunk motor neurons. All right, so from this, it's going to go through the pons and then shoot out on the other side into the pyramids before crossing at the spinomedullary junction. And we're going to look at, at sec sections through each of these levels. So here is the midbrain. <clears throat> This is the substantia nigra. You've seen that before. Here's the aqueduct. This is superior colliculus. Floating up here is the pineal gland. And in this middle third is head, tr head, arm, trunk, leg. Head, arm, trunk, leg. Okay. And then as you come back into the, uh, uh, the ponds, the, uh, the information traveling through is, is contained down here. You can see there are axons, white axons that are traveling through. The topography in the ponds is very poor, um, so I, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, and then once you get to the medulla, you're, the information is in the pyramids. And there, once again, it, it's angled this way. So it's head, uh, arms, trunk, leg as you go up from the uh, ventromedial to the dorsolateral part of the pyramids. All right. Um, the other thing to remember is that at this point, there's l much less of the corticobulbar tract left. So the part of the corticobulbar tract that's going off to motor trigeminal and to the facial nucleus has already left. 
and what's contained here is information going to the nucleus ambiguous and to hypoglossal. So you, you already know how the corticospinal tract, the lateral corticospinal tract works. It's going to innervate um, motor neurons that control muscles on the opposite side of the body. The corticobulbar tract is a little bit different because the laterality is different for every endpoint, and that's what we're going to look at next. <music>